in the depths of the Arabian sand. The history of this region remembers about the western traveler who is attracted by the magic of the east and its mysteries. He lived in its territory and he acquired the beliefs and customs of their peoples. A British officer who had aspired since his youth to be a great and famous. He had many talents and wonderful abilities. Wander through valleys, mountains and the Arabic desert which he arrived the first time in 1917. He worked in the administrative and political fields. He has been always in conflict with the three British administration in India, Iraq and Eastern Jordan. He simply felt that he was like Prometheus, defines the gods for the common good. That man is Harry's son John Filippi or Hajj Abdullah Filippi. On 3rd of April 1885, Harry's son John Philby was born from the two British parents in one of the tea plantations in Ceylon Island, now Sri Lanka. He belongs to a conservative English family in her Orthodox Christian religion. His father Monty Harry went to Ceylon Island in the 1870s to find a work. He married a girl named Queenie. She is a daughter, the commander of the British garrison on that colonial island, which is known for its religious diversity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity. His father was steeped in his lust and many depths. His mother had to return to England in 1891 to raise her children there. When Philby joined the school, he known for his activity, when he won all the prize in the competition in where he competed. In his last year, he became a leader of the students. He was educated at Westminster College, then at Trinity College in Cambridge, where he studied Oriental languages at the hands of Orientalist Edward Brown. Philby was influenced to his teacher, Edward. He described him as the most inspiring teacher I've met in my life, a fickle opponent to the fullest extent, but fiercely enthusiastic rich in culture and science, to the point where one gains the passion to know the East and its peoples. In his youth, Philby's ideas began moving towards the socialism and intellectual liberalism. Throughout his years in college, he hid his radicalism. He was later joined to a group of Fabians. I was born a Christian and a conservative, but actually my life in Ceylon was not affected by these considerations. However, my nanny insisted on our religious upbringing, and I was certainly a Christian and a conservative. In my last phase of education, I began to doubt about the justice of my beliefs. I threw it all out and put it aside, without feeling any pain in my conscience and feelings. I saw the light shining, and my inner depths were devoid of any kind of opportunism. He joined to the service of the British Indian government, ICS. He was promoted to different administrative positions, moving from place to place. In 1908, he was sent to Pakistan in Lahu City, when he learned Edu, Punjabi, Baluchi, and Persian languages. Ferbi talked about this period in his memoirs. I may have been the first socialist to enter the Indian civil service, and I think I horrified most of my friends by announcing from the beginning that I am committed to Indian independence. He has been described by the administration there as a person with the radical communist enthusiast. His first act of rebellion was his marriage to Dora Johnson, as the daughter of a small British employee in September 1910. Her cousin, Bernard Montgomery, was a witness to this marriage, who was later became the supreme commander of the Allies in World War II. In India, there were many differences in views between Philby and British administration. He has received many criticisms from his managers for his call for India independence 
and he was refused to obey the law's issues from British Deputy Governor Sir Louis William Dame. In November 1914, after the declaration of war against Turkey, British Indian troops were landed in Iraq, where the base area in the south of the country was occupied. There was a pair there an urgent need to rebuild the administrative organization, especially after the withdrawal of the Turkish troops from the region. Felby was chosen with the number of the staff to do that job. He arrived in Iraq in 1915 to practice his first experience in the Arab world. He became part of the British officials who played an important role in determining the fate of that region and chart its future. Philpi was sent by Percy Cox, the British High Representative in Iraq, to Baghdad in the position of the Director of the Financial Department of the British Administration and to oversee the publication of the newspaper in favor of the British propaganda. Philby's talents appeared in the administrative work. Later, he became a personal assistant to the ruler of Baghdad, Percy Cox. In November 1917, in the Arabian Peninsula, with the development of the conflict in the region between Sharif Hussein, the governor of Mecca, and Abdul Aziz Al Saud, Sheikh of the Wahhabi tribe, the British government decided to send Philby in the Arabian Peninsula at the head of a mission to Ibn Saud, the name used by Abdul Aziz Al Saud, in order to find a solution in that dispute. In his book, The Heart of Arabia, Philby describes his first meeting with Abdul Aziz Al Saud with the presence of his old father, Abdul Rahman, when he says, During the discussions, I noticed someone else in the tent when we entered behind one of the pillars, a tall man wearing a white dress with a brown cloak. His facial features have a manliness, but in the presence of his father, he is only the obedient boy. This was the Abin Saud himself, ruler of Najad, as he was called then, and before he inherited the titles like Sultan or King. At that time, the First World War was practically over for Britain and the Allies. Philip returned to Iraq. There have been differences between him and Sir Anno Tobel Wilson, the British civil commissioner in Baghdad, who wanted to consolidate British rule in Iraq. While Philby believes that the Iraqi people should be given the right to self-determination, the dispute led him to the travel to London. But in 1920, the conditions worse in Iraq, where the tribal rebellion against the British occupation took place. Philby was called back to Iraq to take the post of advisor to the Minister of the Interior in Baghdad. Then he called for the free elections in the country under the Republican system. When Britain was nominated for Faisal bin Hussein to be king of Iraq, Felby's service had been terminated in the country. He went to Iran on vocation compulsory. In November 1921, Felby went to Amman to replace Thomas Edward Lawrence as a British representative in the Emirate of the Eastern Jordan, which was led by Abdullah ibn Sharif Hussein. But the relationship soon became strained between him and British High Commissioner in Palestine, Herbert Samuel. This is because of interventions of Herbert Samuel in the financial and political affairs of the Emirate. This led Philby to resignation from his work. And then he returned to London, where he wrote articles and delivered speeches, criticizing Britain's policy towards the Arabs. On the other hand, the conflict in the Arabian Peninsula was over. The Hashemite family was expelled from the country. Ibn Saud was able to unite the area. 
Philby was able to establish a strong relationship with the new king Abdul Aziz Al Saud. He became Ibn Saud chief advisor in dealing with the British Empire and Western powers. Philby settled in Jeddah and he founded a small trading company called Al Sharqiya. His company got the four dealing ship to work in the new kingdom. He also contributed to the introduction of radios and telephones. At that stage, Standard Oil of California, Social, negotiated with Felby. The company obtained an exclusive concession for 60 years for exploration and extraction of oil in Al Hassan region along the Persian Gulf over. In 1930, Felby converted to Islam. At the end of 1931, John Felby resumed his travels in the Arabian Peninsula in order to discover the world's largest sandy desert in that region, the M. Dakota. Despite the shortness of that journey, but the discoveries were obtained by Felby were very great. In the next few years, Felby became famous as a writer and international explorer. When the Second World War began, he was convinced that Britain would lose the war to stand against Hitler. He have mentioned in several comments that he expects the loss of France, Britain's ally, of this war also. He asked King Abdul Aziz about his intention to go to India and America to do lectures to show his point of view towards British politics. But when he arrived to Karachi, he was arrested and taken to Britain where he was placed under house arrest. Seven months later, he was released for lack of evidence against him. During the years of the Great War, Felby worked in the arrangement of his memoirs and prepared the drafts of books which he intended to publish. He published his book, A Pilgrim in Arabia, in 1943 and when the second world war ended he returned to saudi arabia at the age of 60. he made several exploratory trips to the arabian desert his book the background of islam was an explanatory of arab history in pure islamic times is based of thousands of ancient manuscripts which he saw while his touring in the arabian peninsula I intend to work on a new theory based on clarifying the roots of the Phoenician and Hebrew peoples. However, the most important study I have done is my attempt to reconcile what is stated in the Torah and what is found in the manuscripts from the life of Abraham the prophet. Here I saw that the people of southern Arabia were the first to invent the alphabet and that they were writing and speaking in Arabic which stands as the oldest language spoken in the world. After the death of King Abdul Aziz in 1953, he criticized his successor, King Saud, son of Abdul Aziz, because of extravagance of the royal family and its corruption, which made King Saud feel insulted. He was expelled to Lebanon in April 1955. In exile, he wrote 40 years in the wilderness. In his book, Felby explained his views opposing the way the royal family ruled in Saudi Arabia. In the same period, his wife Dura died in London. After that, his problem with the Saudi king was resolved through the mediation of some ruling figures. In 1960, on a visit to his son Kim in Beirut, Philby suddenly became ill and was rushed to hospital. Then he died there. He is buried in the Muslim cemetery in the Pasta district of Beirut. His tombstone reads, Greatest of Arabian Explorers.